Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Uh, Yom Kippur, or Day of Atonement uh, in the Hebrew. Um, I like to use the Day of Coverings as Kippur, Kippuret, is related to a covering, of course, and we know that we are covered by the blood of Yeshua through his finished work at Calvary and in the heavenly sphere, in the tabernacle not made with man's hands. Uh, Yom Kippur is often overlooked, but there's vast mysteries involved in the eternal um, redemption that was sealed by Yeshua. Um, I was once asked, and it was by Paul, actually, Paul Hines, uh, what's the greatest miracle Yeshua ever did, bro? And it did get me thinking, and we, uh, we were reasoning on the matter. We were reasoning on the matter. And I was like, wow, yeah, wow. Walking on water, maybe, you know giving sight to the blind, raising Lazarus from the dead. And Yeshua, uh, uh, Paul mentions Yeshua, uh, the cross of Calvary and, you know, and his ascension. And I was like, yeah, that's it right there. You know, of course, that's the greatest miracle. And he's right. The high priest, the officiator became the offering and went into the heavenly sphere with his own blood and made eternal redemption for all time. It's quite incredible, that, isn't it? It's quite incredible. So let's break it down, the Day of Atonement, in a nutshell. The Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, is the most solemn holy day of Yahweh's calendar. It was the day when the high priest made a unique sacrifice for the sins of the people in the temple of God. It was the only time a year that the high priest was able to enter into the most holy place and make atonement for the nation on the mercy seat. It was the only time when a man went before the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. Isn't that incredible? Upon his ascension, Yeshua, who was our high priest, entered into the most holy place in the heavenly sphere, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own precious blood to cleanse and to blot out our iniquity. Such an act has brought about a timeless miracle whereby believers can reconcile themselves back to God, even today, and have at one moment with him through Yeshua. So it's an overlooked feast in the Moedim. It's an overlooked miracle, but it is probably the most important thing that ever happened in the history of all mankind. And this is what I believe Yeshua meant when he said, I, I'm the only way to the Father. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. This is what he meant, that he was the only offering of atonement that could reconcile us back to God. And he was the only one who was able to go to the Heavenly Father and atone for our sins so that we could draw near to God and be reconciled to an eternal creator. Though we were sinners, though we were wretches, we could now come boldly into the throne room of grace. He is the only way to the Father. Nobody goes to the Father except through him. In that same verse, he did say to the disciples, I am going to the Father and you all should rejoice that I go to the Father. And why do you think he said that? Why do you think Yeshua said that? What did he mean exactly when he said he was going to the Father? And why, what did he mean when he said that you should rejoice that I am going to the Father? So for a first century Jew, the only way to the Father was through the holy place. It was through the sacrifices in the Temple Institute. Therefore, when Yeshua said that he was the only way to the Father, he was revealing that he would be the sacrifice that would reconcile and give us access, genuine access and permission to the Father's presence. And where do we see the evidence for this? We see the fulfillment of this access. When Yeshua was crucified and the temple veil was torn in half. There was a great earthquake and the scriptures speak that the veil was torn. This was symbolic of many things, but it showed that the most holy place was now exposed to the layman. All had access, all had permission. We could all come boldly into the throne room of grace now through our high priest who had finally made permanent reconciliation between us and God for them that believe in him in faith. He has achieved this for them. We have to accept it, it's a free gift. And it's through our faith that we are reconciled to God through what Yeshua has done. 
So yet we see the fulfillment of this. When the veil was torn, the Holy of Holies became accessible. We all have access to the presence of the Most High. Isn't that incredible? This was a time when the most holiest man would go into the most holiest place and deal with sin in secret. Yeshua went into a heavenly sphere and dealt with sin for all time. And we all now have permission to access God. It's quite incredible. And, and because of that act, that's brought all of us in this room today, 2,000 years later, because he went into an, an eternal place where there's no time or no space. And he made atonement in a place not governed by a clock or physics, that means any believer for any time between then and now, for all time, they can be reconciled in this redemptive story. Beautiful, eternal redemption obtained. This is why he said you'd rejoice if you knew when I was going. Because it's the time to rejoice for such action that's been accomplished. The Messiah would give his life and be the offering and the officiator of the renewed covenant. Enter into the heavenly sphere and obtain eternal redemption for the souls of this earth wow quite incredible hebrews 4 14 to 16 puts it like this seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens yeshua the son of god let us hold fast our confession what is this day all about for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but in all ways was tempted as we are yet he did not sin let us therefore come boldly into the throne room of grace mm. that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Mm. Isn't that incredible? You wouldn't, you wouldn't understand these verses. Remember, this was addressed to the Hebrews. The author of Hebrews addressed this to the Hebrews. We should know what this means because this day was all about what the high priest did and how the atonement for the nation was made and how we could be reconciled back to God. So it makes a lot more sense when seen through the lens of Yeshua. So he's the officiator, he's the high priest, but he's also the offering. Listen to this, 1 John 2, 2. He, Yeshua, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only our sins, but also the sins of the whole world. So powerful, so radical, so permanent was this intercession of atonement that his blood was sufficient for the whole world. We have to just believe it and walk in faith and walk it out wholeheartedly into Shuva. Once we've been given this grace and we understand this atonement, this is what causes us to turn away from our sin. Because how who we have died to sin shall live in it any longer. This is the beauty about the renewed covenant. It was so that we could be empowered to turn away from sin, not to continue on in it, not to continue on in it. Yeshua said, nobody comes to the Father except through him. Do we understand why now? He's the high priest who officiates the atonement. He's also the offering that reconciles us back to God. This is the God we serve. Praise Yah. Amen. Romans 3.25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Unless you were doing the day of atonement, these scriptures aren't going to make any sense to you. But when you walk in the Moedim, the scripture comes alive. You're like, oh, wow. This is what all the epistles are speaking about. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. When we stand before a holy, awesome, divine God and we have sinned, the soul that sins shall die. We'll just be disintegrated in his presence. Therefore, we needed a covering. We needed a kippurim. We needed Yeshua's blood to cover us. And he became the propitiation of God's judgment upon sin. He became that propitiation of God's judgment for sin. And he made him who knew no sin become sin for us, that we may become the righteousness of God. It's incredible. And this is what took place on Yom Kippur. Christ became that propitiation through the shedding of his blood. This is received, gifted, and reconciled through our acceptance of him by our faith. And he did this to demonstrate his righteousness. I love that. He did it to demonstrate that he's a good, loving father and that he wanted to redeem us and that he desireth no soul to perish. He made an evacuation plan, even though we were sinners. He put himself on the line and died on our behalf so that we could be redeemed though we're sinners and wretches. 
And this is why we go out into the world and love others because he first loved us. And this is the love of God that he first loved us and died for us while we were still sinners. So he's, he, this is a revelation today of God's love. It's a revelation of God's love. So Paul wasn't making anything up when he said Christ was presented as the atonement sacrifice of God. Every first century Jew should, would know this. They'd know, we, we know what this is. He's our atonement sacrifice. So where do we find this in, in the Torah? Leviticus 16 verse one. Let's look at the type and shadow, the blueprint that we find in the words of Moses. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Aaron shall come into the holy place. He shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle meeting. He shall put on his holy linen tunic, the linen trousers upon his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash and the linen turban he shall be attired in. These are the holy garments. So he's, he's changing his identity here, very similar to how Yeshua changed. And he, he, was, he was glorified. He became in his glorified body, hence the white yeah. linen. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. Verse 30, for on that day, the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So for the Israelites of old, this was the most important day when the most holiest man went into the most holiest place to do the most holiest ritual at the most holiest time with the most holiest garments. But we read that they did this annually, cyclically, they had to do this because the blood of bull and goats could not redeem us. It couldn't atone for our sin. It couldn't atone for our sin. Otherwise Christ wouldn't need to come. We just keep slaying bulls and goats, but it became futile. But Christ came a more perfect offering, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with the sinless blood of the Son of God to atone for our sin, oh, quite incredible. This is what our Messiah did on the screen, but in the heavenly sphere. What we're reading about here is the typology, it's the blueprints, it's the architectural drawing of what Yeshua was actually gonna do in a supernatural way in the Shemaim, in the heavens above. Isn't that incredible? And on the screen we see the priests and you know the old school typology of it. But what did this look like? We have no idea. <laughs> we have no idea. Our high priest Yeshua going into the heavenly sphere where time and space doesn't exist, into the infiniteness and making redemption in an infinite realm. Hence, sin has been dealt with once and for all. Isn't that incredible? We can't even get our head around it. Yeshua went into a timeless place in a temple not made with human hands. That is not of this creation, not in this 3D reality. He went beyond this reality, ungoverned by the laws of physics, uncontrolled by time and space, and he made atonement right before our Father's throne, rendering an eternal redemption for anyone at any time in any place. That's why, beloved, 2,000 years later, believers all over the world, no matter where you are, when you come to the knowledge and the truth of Yeshua and you believe and you confess upon him, you can be saved because he went to a place beyond space and time and made eternal redemption. It's mind bending. He, he hacked the matrix. He hacked the matrix, you know. <laughs> Yeshua hacked the matrix. For this reason, he is the only way to the Father. The only way to at one moment with God is through him. He paid the price once and for all. As the scriptures said, if the principalities of this world knew what was taking place, they would not have crucified our Lord to glory. That's what the Bible says, you know. It says if the devil knew what was going on then, they would never have crucified them. The principalities and fallen angels would never have let that happen because it would have made eternal redemption and saved the day, saved the day. The high priest alone, Hebrews 9, 11 to 28. But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come, 
with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with human hands. That is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered into the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purification of flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For Christ is not entered into a holy place made with hands, which is in fact a copy of the one true one in heaven, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly await for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Praise Yah. Praise Yah. 2,000 years later, it's what brought you to this room today. It's what brought that relationship between you and God. It's how you can hear his voice, feel his spirit and know him. This is how you get to know God now. Because previously, God's turned his face, he's turned his back. But through Yeshua, he turns his face. He turns his face to look at the most beloved in you. The most beloved in you. Not through our own works, least any man can boast, but the Yeshua within you. And this is why Yom Kippur also shadows the final judgment. Because on a day today of Yom Kippur, in the future, in the not so distant future, the Day of Atonement is Judgment Day. And that's why we make ourselves low, we humble ourselves, we afflict ourselves, we teshuva, we confess, we call upon his name. Because today is when the Great White Throne Judgment will take place. The books will all be closed. The movie reel is just gonna run out. Everything will be called to mind. The angels will be watching. We will all have to give an account before Yeshua. I often think what I do at the Great White Throne Judgment, you know, I'm not going to say, well, I did Shabbat and uh, yeah, I had a fellowship at my house and I used to pray on my knees. I'm just going to say, Lord God, I am a wretch. Do not destroy me. The blood of Yeshua. I'm just going to, I'm just going to be pleading the blood of Yeshua, mate. I'm just going to be saying, oh Lord, not me. Look at Yeshua, please. Don't throw me in that fire. Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. That's all you're going to say, isn't it? Because what can we do? What, what can we do that's going to suffice? Nothing. Only what he did. And this is why we love him. This is why we serve him and do what we do. I'm just going to say Yeshua's blood, Yeshua's blood. I'm just going to be proclaiming it. So if you see me going mad, I'm proclaiming the blood of Yeshua. That's why. It's a serious time. It's a serious time. This is why we need to be of godly teshuva, of a contrite spirit of a broken heart, draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your heart. Will our names be etched into the book of life forever? The day of atonement calls us to reflect on this ultimate principle and practice it as though it was judgment day today. Because one day this is going to be a very real reality. Daniel 12, the last prophetic words of Daniel. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watching over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never been seen, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book and many of those who sleep in the dust shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting Contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That's like the eighth day, the prophetic eighth day, when we're not in these bodies anymore. We're going to be like the angelic, the stars of heaven. It's a realm that we can't even fully comprehend. But I've discussed this in the past, how we will be like the stars, beings of light. Some to everlasting shame, some to everlasting life. We want to be etched in the book of life, don't we? We want to be etched in the book of life, having our destiny sealed. We do it now. We do it now. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Today, if we've heard his voice, do not harden your heart like they did in the waters of Meribah. We do it now. We do it now. We serve him today. We choose him now. Not, not at the great white throne. You don't want to risk it then. You want to do it now. 
and believe in him now through faith, we shall be saved through his grace. And again, Revelation 20, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face of the earth and heaven had fled away. It says when he returns, the sun and the moon are gonna be dumbfounded and just get off. When Yeshua comes back, the sun and the moon are just gonna go, they're just gonna go running. At the face of, at, the, at his face, heaven and earth fled away. Wow. And there was found no place for them. <laughs> Serious. Nothing else is going to matter. Verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were rich, written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, that is, the second death. Verse 15, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Wow. Serious. This is like spiritual destruction. It's like obliteration. The Lord, who is infinite, will not allow sin to go on for eternity. Eventually, the eternal God does not want sin and evil and wickedness to be with him for eternity. So eventually, he's going to end it and just take it out of the computer game. He's just going to write it out of the software. He's just going to delete all files on the matter. And them who have been plugged into them files of sin and evil, they're just going to get deleted with it. That's how it's going to go. God's eternal. He isn't going to let sin go on for eternity. It's got to end sooner or later. We want to let it end now in our lives. Hallelujah. And Yom Kippur alludes to this. And that's why it's a solemn day. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. The Lord's mercy is unstoppable. It's radical. It's beautiful. It's the triumph that we should all rest in because where sin abound, grace abound all the more. Amen. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon. Eternal redemption, eternal redemption. Wow, he seriously has dealt with sin, hasn't he? Yeshua has dealt with sin. Praise God, praise God for Yeshua. Thank you, Lord, for the lamb. And this is why our master in his earthly ministry just went round saying this, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Because this is going to be a very real reality. And this is why our master's ministry was Teshuvah, turn back to the covenant, turn back to the wedding vows, be saved, crooked generation, be saved, repent for the kingdom of God is here, it's here. This was a major pillar in Messiah's ministry. David expresses his repentance like this in, in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that I may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was even brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward part and in the hidden part. You will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. The cross of Calvary, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew in me a steadfast spirit. Do not cast me away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your Yeshua and uphold me by your gracious spirit. Then, I will teach transgressors your ways. I will teach sinners that they shall be converted unto you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice or I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. We're all here doing mitzvahs. Yeah, we want to please Yah. 
But I'm telling you now, listen to the sacrifice that God wants. A broken spirit and a contrite heart. These God will never reject. He will not despise this. You want access to the Lord. It's with the broken spirit and the contrite heart because these he does not despise. Then you will be pleased with sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole offerings. Then I shall offer bulls on your altar. Now, when David said this, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. And in Isaiah, again, though our sins may be like scarlet, they shall be whiter than snow. This is alluding to us who will be washed. We are washed. We have washed our robes in the blood of the lamb and we've made them white. That's quite paradoxical, isn't it? How do you wash your, your linen robes? in blood and they turn white it's through the eternal redemption of Yeshua yet again and who are these oh this is the great multitude that no one can number this is in revelation before the lamb clothed in white robes crying out with a loud voice Yeshua belongs to Adonai who sits on the throne and to the lamb this is who we want to be singing that song praise God but curiously for every first century Jew who understood Isaiah 118, the sins of scarlet that turned white, earth and snow, though they were like red, like crimson. This was a cryptic message that the prophets alluded to. Because on the screen is a text taken from the Mishnah, which is a Jewish liturgy describing temple rites and institutes in the first century. And what used to take place on Yom Kippur, as we've just read in Leviticus, a lot would be cast and the lot which the Lord, uh, fell, it would uh, be the sacrifice unto the Lord. And this red ribbon, they used to take this red ribbon and tie it round the handle of the temple. And if the red ribbon turned white, they'd know that sins were atoned for. So though it was red like crimson, he would make us whiter than snow. It was a supernatural event that took place. Check it out on the screen. He tied crimson thread on the head of the goat, which was to be sent away and placed it at the place where it would later be sent. And he placed the goats that would be slaughtered at the place where it would be slaughtered. And then it goes on to say, they would take the crimson thread. If it turned white, they would be happy. And if it didn't turn white, they would be sad and ashamed. And after the death of Yeshua, this red ribbon stopped turning white. And this is also taken from the Talmud. The rabbis taught that 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple, the lot did not come up in the high priest's right hand, nor did the tongue, uh, the tongue of scarlet will become white. So even way, this is like going on before. It's like the Lord wasn't there because Yeshua was the only one who had to deal with the sins. This was a supernatural event. This is in Jewish texts. So though our sins may be like scarlet, we shall become whiter than snow. So on the screen, this is Yom Kippur. This is what took place. Two goats were presented before the Lord. And this crimson would identify who was who. Curiously, when Yeshua was crucified, what took place? He was dressed in a scarlet robe. Then they released Barabbas to them, but they had Yeshua flogged and handed him over to be crucified. They then stripped Jesus and put a scarlet robe upon him. He actually embodies the atonement sacrifice on earth. Imagine how he felt when he knew that the goat to be sacrificed was arrayed with a scarlet crimson thread and then they just put that crimson robe on him and he knows what he's going to become. Deep. We then see how the goat was presented before the entire nation and all the sins were placed upon the goat. The offering, though it was innocent, though the goat had never sinned, it became the embodiment of sin. Like Yeshua, he was presented before the nation and he was accused and sin was placed upon him, though he was innocent. Corinthians 5, 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's the same story. It's the same story. He was without blemish. There was no guile found within his mouth. And who was there at the time? The high priest. Crucify him. He's a sinner. Crucify him. They placed the sins of the nation upon him. Also, when Yeshua was condemned to death, who was freed? Barabbas. Barabbas was freed, that's right. There was one who was freed. At the time, Yeshua uh, was uh, crucified just before his crucifixion. There was two that stood before the nation. 
One was crucified, one, was one became the atonement sacrifice, another was freed. What's quite curious is Barabbas also means son of the father. So we've got the son of the father and the son of the father, like the two goats. One becomes dressed in crimson and becomes the atonement sacrifice. The other is freed to the wilderness to bear sin and iniquity. Just like Barabbas who was freed. You couldn't make this up. The two identical goats that would be picked on Yom Kippur. One dressed in crimson becomes the sacrifice. One would be free. Go ahead. I was reading the translation on that uh, today. I, it actually says some of them now, some translations will say Jesus in, in brackets, like as in like um, Barabbas' other name is also Jesus. Yeah. So it's Yeshua and Yeshua. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, 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 And yeah, the yeah. people are like, which one do you want to free? And they're like, we know from the text um, Barabbas was like a murderer and a thief, I think he was, wasn't he? Yeah. And he, they chose him, but obviously it was fulfilled. Beautiful. Now, what used to take place on Yom Kippur is this goat that went free would just keep coming back into the camp. It'd just keep coming back. They'd all be like, yeah, the atonement's made. Uh, the crimson ribbons turned white. The high priest would come out and say it is finished. Everyone would rejoice. They'd all break the fast. They'd all take the sackcloth off. And then next minute, they'd be like, bro, there's that goat again. <laughs> no, serious, bro, it's back again. They'd be like, what? And he'd be like, there's that goat again, bro. Didn't you get rid of it? And he'd be like, bro, I took it across over the other side, man. I've been going through the desert with it. I don't know how it's got back here. It must have got a taxi. This thing would just keep coming back. So what they decided to do, they'd take this scapegoat and they'd take it up to a high ravine and they'd push it off. And this goat would go tumbling down and it'd just splat into pieces. And they, that's how they were dealing with it then. And this, this goat of Azazel, this fallen angel that bore iniquities, it wouldn't return because, yeah, well, we've killed it. We've done away with it. So that was how they coped uh, with this. And this is even written about it in the Mishnah. Again, this Jewish literacy of the first uh, century and the Temple Institutes. Mishnah Yoma 6.6. 6. The priest would push the goat over backward and it would roll down the ravine and it did not reach halfway down the mountain before it broke into pieces. So this is how they dealt with it again. Now what's curious is this goat was called Azazel. It was the goat for Azazel. And Azazel, as we know, for them who have studied um, other uh, non-canonical texts, Azazel is a fallen angel, okay? What a curious thing to call the goat. Why would you name it after a fallen angel? Wow, that's so strange. And if you look at the Aramaic in plain English, it gives you it word for word. And Aaron shall cast lots for both the goats, one for the Lord, Yehovah, and the other for Azazel. Isn't that interesting? Remember, this was the goat for Azazel and it comes as no surprise then that the nation never wanted this goat to return again because they understood the implications of what it meant when this thing keep coming back, kept coming back. It was like, whoa, we need this thing out for good. I tell you what, let's just throw it off a cliff and yeah, we sorted that one out. But obviously uh, the atonement would take place every year. Okay, but what's the prophetic picture of this? Why Azazel? What's to do with this fallen angel? A devil? A demon? What, what is this? A fallen angelic host goes by the name of Azazel that sinned against Yah and his creation in the book of Enoch. What is the connection? Why would one goat need to be thrown off a cliff and smashed to pieces? And what is the connection that we see in Yeshua and his ministry? There's two accounts of Judas' death, and I believe both accounts actually are the same event. We just get two pieces of information, two separate pieces of detail that actually summarize one event. The Bible reveals the death of Judas, and it has an eerie connection to the scapegoat, Azazel, that was sent into the wilderness to be disemboweled. Listen to this, Acts chapter 1, verse 18. Judas falls and his body bursts open. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and his entrails spilled out. Now, a lot of people say that the death of Judas is a contradiction because in another account, he hangs himself. Matthew 27, early in the morning, the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans to have Yeshua executed. So they bound him up, led him away to Pilate, the governor. And when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned with the 30 pieces of silver. And he said, I have sinned, for I have betrayed innocent blood. And the Pharisees replied, so what is that to us? That's your responsibility. 
So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. He then went and hanged himself. What I want to submit to you is something quite astonishing. It's my belief that as Judas hung himself, his whole body become bruised. And as he sat, he sat swinging on this tree for a long time over a great ravine, ravine, when the earthquake occurred, the rope snapped and Judas fell to the ground and become disembodied. He is the picture of Azazel, the fallen one who betrays Yeshua into death. And then he is disemboweled, he's pushed off. He's the scapegoat that's sent away, that bears iniquity. What do we have? We have an image of an identical goat. Remember, Judas means Judah. It's Judah. Judas, a brother of Jesus, Jesus, one of his brethren. He was sent away, perplexed into the wilderness, full of guilt, shame and condemnation, only to fall off a cliff and be disemboweled. And it's known that when people hang themselves, they become like a giant grape. And often if the rope sna snaps, because they're so puffed up, if you ever touch someone who's got a real severe bruising, and it's like a grape, it's like it's ready to burst. When he fell off the great ravine, he was disemboweled, disembodied, just like Azazel that was pushed off the great ravine. So even in Judas, we see the Azazel goat, don't we? That's sent away into the wilderness to bear iniquity and shame and guilt and condemnation. We have an image Judas, the embodiment of the betrayer of the Most High. He is a picture of the Antichrist that betrays God for his own gain. And I think that this confirmation can be found in the words of the Master himself. John 6, verse 70. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He even said Judas was a, was a demon. In the Greek, Diablos. Uh, he actually called him a devil, a demon. So we actually see it in the words of Yeshua, that he fulfills the typology of the goat that's disemboweled. The contemporary English, yet one of you is a demon. Enoch tells us that Azazel shall be placed into darkness. Again, the Lord said to Raphael, bind Azazel hand of foot and cast him into darkness and the opening in the desert, cast him in there, throw upon him and hail pointed stones, covering him with darkness. There he shall remain forever, cover his face that he may not see the light. And in the great day of judgment, let them be cast into the lake of fire. Deep, so deep. Yeshua said it would be better that that man had never been born. Revelations 20.10 And the devil and them that deceive were cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they shall be tormented day and night forevermore. In this though, there is something quite remarkable and beautiful that takes place. God wipes away every tear from our eye. There will be no more suffering, no more pain. This is actually a great thing when the beast and the false prophets and Azazel and all these fallen angels go to the lake of fire because it means that we're going to move into a place where there's no evil, no hatred, no malice, no wickedness, no sin. We're going to move into an eternal realm of goodness and righteousness forever. So that what takes place is actually a good thing. I am glad God is going to judge sin and iniquity. I love Yah that he's a perfect judge and he's going to judge evil. I don't want Buddha who's yin and yang and it's just all an expression of consciousness. Give me Yahovah who's a warrior God who's coming to wage war on sin and iniquity and he's going to destroy the devil and he's going to destroy all the fallen angels and he's going to wipe away evil and iniquity. I want that. That's the God that I want to serve. And we're coming to a close. 1 John 1, 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is the light, we have fellowship one, with one another. And the blood of Yeshua cleanses us from all of our sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise Yah. Praise Yah. Leviticus 23, 29. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. We have to make ourselves low because he was the one who was afflicted on our behalf. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before the shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. We have to humble ourselves 
for the meek shall inherit the earth. Philippians 2 verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death, even to the point of the cross. Praise Yah. And finally, to end, when the high priest had made atonement on Yom Kippur, after the ritual was done, the whole nation would stand by waiting. Is atonement going to be made? Is the, is the crimson going to turn white? And the high priest would come out and he would reiterate these words. Tam vanish lam. Tam vanish lam. And everyone would now and say, Tam vanish lam. They would all be shouting, it is finished. When Yeshua had received the sour wine, he said, Tam vanish lam. It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. <sighs> Can we fully comprehend what took place that day? Praise Yah. Praise Yah. If the principalities knew, they would not have crucified our Lord to glory. No way. No way. No way would they have done that, mate. The devil was like, what's happened? What? It's over, boys. It's over. Right. We're going to try and take as many as we can with them. And God's like, well, they're your offspring anyway, so I've got this all worked out. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah. It's through Yeshua's atoning sacrifice that we now have at one moment with God. Oh, and I will end with this final scripture. One John, thank you for your patience all. And he himself is the atonement for our sins. And not for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments... He who says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly, the love of God is perfected in him. And by this, we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him or to walk as he walked. How did he walk? Zitzi wearing, kosher eating, synagogue attending, moedim keeping, chauffeur blowing, Jew. We want to walk, we want to halach as he halacht. Brethren, I write to you no new commandment, but an old commandment which you've had from better sheaths from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. The beginning of the Bible. No new commandments, but one you've heard from the beginning of the word. As soon as John explains this supreme atonement sacrifice of Yeshua to the reader, he couples it with what? Keeping the commandments John marries the two together atonement and keeping the commandments that's what we want to do here let's pray hallelujah father God thank you for the perseverance um, that you've distilled on the saints today we truly have afflicted ourselves Lord I thank you father for the humility of the brothers and the sisters Lord I thank you father for convicting us and bringing to light things that we need to deal with in ourselves thank you lord for giving us the strength some people involuntary fast lord they go days weeks without food they don't even want to do that lord and we live with such luxury in this life it's really important that we recognize lord we are fragile and we need to depend on you so thank you lord for getting us through this fast we we pray lord that our fast has been a sweet aroma unto you in the name of jesus christ yeshua hamashiach we bless you adonai and we bless the food we bless the hands of them that prepared and we thank you lord in yeshua's name amen Thank you.